Welcome to a conversation on East Austin blues and jazz history sponsored by the Texas Music Museum in conjunction with their exhibition on blues and jazz and with the support of the Cultural Arts Division of the City of Austin uh, Economic Development Department. My name is Jason Mellard. I'm a board member of the Texas Music Museum and the director of the Center for Texas Music History at Texas State University. We're joined today by two writers and experts in the field, Michael Corcoran and Karan Spearman. Karan Spearman is a writer, editor, market professional, and content creator based in Austin, whose work has appeared in the Austin Chronicle, The Daily Dot, and Texas Music Magazine. He's contributed significant articles on the East Austin artists Kenny Dorham and James Polk, as well as one of the very first major features on Austin's globe-conquering Black Pumas. Michael Corcoran is a venerable music writer with a long career at the Austin Chronicle, the Dallas Morning News, the Austin American Statesman, Texas Highways, and many other publications. His groundbreaking research on gospel figures, Blind Willie Johnson, Arizona Drains, and Washington Phillips has earned two Grammy nominations. He has published three books, All Over the Map, True Heroes of Texas Music, He Is My Story, The Sanctified Soul of Arizona Drains. And one of the things that brings us here today, the new publication of Ghost Notes, Pioneering Spirits of Texas Music. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us. I wanted to start out by um, talking about what brought you to these East Austin blues and jazz figures. Both of you have covered sort of unsung heroes or artists who have been unheralded, especially and sort of misunderstood in their own hometowns. Uh, what brought you to uh, some of these subjects and championing them through your research and writing? Go ahead, Michael. Well, Karan, I was going to ask you how you came about uh, your interest with Kenny Doran. Oh, um, that actually started, uh, I was working overseas. Um, I was doing some contract work overseas and um, you know, I'd been kind of aware of Kenny Doran, you know, now I've become something of a, a vinyl collector and got a bunch of jazz, you know, you get the basic jazz things that you're supposed to get. You know, you get the, the Rollins and uh, Davis and, and, and Coltrane and whatnot. And so it took me a little bit to get to, to Kenny. And then I discovered while I was in uh, Istanbul, Turkey, that, you know, I, that he was, you know, at least in part from Austin, Texas. And I was like, wow, that's, I'm all the way over here. I'm listening to Kenny Dorham all the way over here. And he's from all the way over there. That's amazing. So that was my first awareness of Kenny. And, you know, I thought in the future, I was like, he'd be, I thought to myself, he'd be an interesting person to write about. Um, it, and it felt, you know, he's kind of got this kind of, it's a very Southwestern thing he's got going on. It's not readily apparent all the time, but it felt homey. I guess it's kind of what it felt kind of Texas-ish in certain parts of his catalog um, that I started collecting. Um, yeah, so that's that's where it, my awareness of him and uh, me digging into his talent and his catalog kind of started in Istanbul. Were, were you a fan of his music before you realized he was from Austin? Um, yeah, I mean, because I, you know, I knew of his work, like in like the original messengers and things like that. So mm -hmm. um, I guess in a way, I, I had already been, you know, I'd seen them in the, in the, in the liner notes, you know, so I knew yeah. who he was. And I was like, oh, it's, it's pretty good. And then I got Afro Cuban and then, you know, just kind of went on from there. Um, and I think it, it wasn't until a uh, discovery of his last solo record, uh, Trompeta Toccata, um, that I, I found out that he was from Austin. It wasn't until then where I was like, okay, well, I started getting into the locations of just, where are people getting these sounds from? Why do they sound this way? And why do they sound different? You know, started, I started noticing, you know, little small differences between the, you know, between trumpet players. You know, yeah. Freddie Hubbard is different, is, you know, is different from you know, uh, uh, Kenny and Kenny's different from so and so and so and so on and so forth. So in that, I went, I went into kind of a bit of a discovery mode and um, trying to find out where all these people were from. Yeah, I, I hadn't really even heard of him until I started doing that story on B.L. Joyce, the great band leader from East Austin, who's really 
what I'm looking for a lot of times in my research is people like one person that makes a huge difference that people don't really know about. And Benjamin Leo Joyce, B.L. Joyce, who's a band leader at uh, L.C. Anderson High School, the black high school in town, for I think 33 years, he had Kenny Dorham under his wing, Gil Askey, who was the Motown arranger. Uh, well, some people that, you know, Ernie Mae Miller, who's, whose grandfather was L.C. Anderson. And it's interesting the way I came to that, uh, when I did that story for the Statesman, it was all about the Yellow Jackets band and B.L. Joyce and, and the people that he uh, taught. And the editor says, well, how did you get that idea for that story? You know, that's not really even in your comfort zone. You know, you're not into marching bands. You, you know, you don't know, you don't live in East Austin. And so I said, well, I, I was doing a story on Blaze Foley and, and Blaze Foley was shot to death. He was a songwriter from Austin, shot to death by a former student at uh, L.C. Anderson High School. And so I called the L.C. Anderson Alumni Association to try to get information on Kerry January, is the name of the guy. And the guy said, oh, you know, he was just here for the reunion. He came back from California for the 35th reunion, high school reunion. And he had all these citations that he showed us. He was, he's doing good work in California. He's an outreach specialist. He's, uh, you know, it was really cool. And he said, if you were, if you were at the paper, you want a really good story, do something on the Yellow Jackets band. And he started telling me about, you know, this guy who was a tailor. B.L. Joyce was a tailor. In fact, he, he was a great band leader and they finally fired him because he didn't have a music degree, even though he'd led the band for 33 years and they had won seven or eight state titles. They always won the state titles and they were a real uh, pride. They were the pride of East Austin. You know, they were the first band that, that marched uh, downtown with all the white bands, 1959, uh, you know, Connolly governor's thing and they blew everybody away. They were the best band, they were the best band by far. So that's, that kind of shows you some of the some of the weird twists and turns. You're doing a story on a, a folk singer, an alcoholic folk singer, and then you end up doing a story on a uh, marching band in East Austin. But I find that that happens a lot of times with me. It's like, I'll be working on something. Like I did the uh, Washington Phillips story and I printed it in the Dallas Observer and some guy saw it and said, you gotta do Blind Willie Johnson. And I didn't really know much about Blind Willie Johnson, but the guy who, who told me about that had visited Marlin in the 70s and knew Blind Willie's wife that sang on his records. And so that got me in that area. You know, it's, it's sort of like Arizona Drains. I became aware of her. I was doing a story on Kirk Franklin and God's Property. You remember that song they had, uh, uh, Stomp? Oh, yeah. The gospel song, number one. It sampled uh, One Nation Under a Groove. So I'm doing this, I'm doing research on Kirk Franklin and interviewed him and I figured I had to get some books to write, to get background on gospel music. And they said that Arizona Drains from Fort Worth was, she invented the gospel beat. And I went, invented the gospel beat? That's rock and roll. That's where rock and roll comes from. That's the source. And so I think a lot of times, I'm not a big fan of her music. I don't listen to her music for enjoyment, but you cannot deny how important she is in the history of popular music. And she actually, uh, you know, she learned how to play in Austin at the blind school. I mean, so many of these untold stories, right? They're names that play across these pages. They're artists who everyone has some awareness of, but if you center their stories, it kind of changes your view on the rest of things. And so for, you know, some of these examples, you know, marching band history is something I think more needs to be done on. The Carver Center has a good sort of Yellow Jackets exhibition um, up in one of their cases, at the end of their hallways. And then the people that y'all are talking about, people like B.L. Joyce and Kenny Dorham, um, if you're driving through East Austin, you might know these names because people have probably seen Harold McMillan's uh, banner for Kenny Dorham's backyard right next to Victory Grill. Or, you know, as we approach Juneteenth, there are signs that appear all over the neighborhood about B.L. Joyce's the Battle of the Bands that happens named after him um, just about every year. But well, that's actually, that's actually Alvin Patterson. That's his protege. Yeah. It has the Battle of the Bands. Oh, okay, okay. He replaced B.L. Joyce. And, and I, if I could make, mention something about him too, and, and, and this, if you have a really good source, it makes all the difference in the world. And I had a great source with Alvin Patterson. He was 80 years old when I interviewed him. And uh, I went to his house to do the story. He had one, one wing of his house was dedicated to the Yellow Jackets band. He had all these programs, he had all these pictures. He had pictures of uh, Teddy Wilson, Kenny Dorham and him 
at the big jazz festival in Austin in 67. And, uh, you know, Teddy Wilson's also from Austin. Mm -hmm. The, you know, great piano player for Benny Goodman and Billy Holiday and everything. And uh, if you have someone like that, and when I did, the, I, I did a story in Austin in the 50s for the Austin Chronicle, and I, my source was Ray Campy. This guy knew everything. You know, people were telling me, don't call Ray Campy. He's going to talk your ear off for two hours. I'm going, that's what I want. I want someone who's going to talk my ear off. I need to go, I need this information. He talks, I take notes. That's the way it works. So I think that's one thing that's really important is finding, and they're all, you know, Ray Campy's 85, 86 years old now. You know, Alvin Patterson, he passed away a year after I interviewed him. These people are gone. They're, they're passing away. They're, they're gone. And when they're gone, you got nobody to talk to about this history. So that's really important to get them while, while they're still alive. And to that note, um, you know, even, you know, doing the, the Durham piece, um, I talked to Jimmy Heath. Um, I talked to a handful of people that, to his point, ended up passing away. Like within, you know, six to eight, nine mm -hmm. months after the piece printed in the Chronicle. Mm -hmm. You know, so you, it's, it's, it's really important. And, and the interesting thing with, with, with Kenny, you know, in the piece, I, I have to put together pieces of what maybe he wanted to say, but didn't just didn't it just wasn't able to to put together. So when you're you're kind of reimagining the person's life, and you're everything is evaporating behind it, and that's that's the, an important thing to remember when you're doing these things um, and talking about these people's history because. I mean, the likelihood of there just being some, I mean, we have the Chronicle specifically, there just being anything else about Kenny Dorm is, is next to none. So you have to be conscious of that too. Like I, I need to make sure I have everything in here and I really have a succinct message because everything behind me is, is gonna be dust very, you know, sooner than later too. Much well, you, want, you want your subjects to inhabit you in some way. Right. And I, think, and I think, I don't, when I read the Kenny Doran piece, I said, this guy listened to Kenny Doran while he wrote this. I could tell. I listened to exclusively Kenny Doran or something real, or a band that Kenny Doran was in. There was at least a two to three month period where I did, I purposefully did not listen to anything other than Kenny Doran yeah. or something related with Kenny Doran in the, if he wasn't the band leader, that, you know, he was just in the band. Yeah, because like, he, he had that lyrical style and the, and the writing was very much in that style. Uh, and I'm not like a buff, you know, that, and I had to realize that about myself. Hmm. I had shortcomings. Like, I'm, I don't come from specifically a jazz tradition. Like, I, I've listened to jazz at, all of my life, but to say that I'm like an expert by any means uh, would be, could not be further from the truth. So there was an education that I had to basically, you know, talking to these people, I had to educate myself and what things sounded like and what things meant. And so I had to, you know, I listened to Africa. There was at one point, I think I listened to Afro Cuban at home on repeat for like the entire day, just that album, even yeah. certain songs. Like I have to kind of like, okay, so what is, what's going on here? And what is the difference between what he did before here? How does this, sort? you know, so I started learning like, Dorm sounded squeaky early on. You know, he's kind of squeaky at this kind of highish, this kind of high voice. He was kind of squeaky. And it wasn't until a little bit later after on that he got um, a little bit post um, um, Coltrane, like, you know, a little bit later on where it kind of, it, it started to fill out. And, you know, so you, but you, you, you just see Kenny Dorm and you don't really notice it. You just, now you start noticing the differences between how he sounded in the 40s and then in the 50s and then in the 60s, you know, and then at the end of his right. life. Well, I think it's important to specialize. I, I, you know, I was about your age, Karan, when I started doing research and I kicked myself for not starting earlier. But I decided, well, I can never know as much as Mac McCormick or Peter Garolnik, all these people have been doing this since they were 18 or 19 years old. So I specialized in Texas music. That's it, Texas music. If they're not from Texas, I don't care. And so I did Sam Cook. I did the Sam Cook box set because he's, he, first of all, he's my favorite singer. Second of all, he's got a tie to Texas. He was in the Soul Stirrers who were from Trinity, Texas. 
That was my in. And then like Washington Phillips, I didn't know where he was from. I found out he was from Texas. Okay, I'm doing him. But if there's someone like, I, I love uh, groups like the Dixie Hummingbirds or uh, uh, the Swan Silvertones, but they're not from Texas. I have to do, I have to stick with Texas people because I can't spread myself that wide. And the other thing too, is I really, I also specialize in gospel because I went and uh, Mac McCormick is really the greatest, uh, in my mind, the greatest music researcher ever from Texas. And I went and saw him uh, when I did the Blind Willie Johnson uh, research and he didn't seem to know much about gospel at all. He was asking me like, what, what makes gospel, what makes Pentecostal singers different than say Baptist singers? And then when I was leaving, I was like, okay, this guy doesn't know gospel. I'm gonna specialize in gospel. It's that whole baseball adage, hit them where they ain't, you know? And that's what I try to do. I try to do stuff that nobody's covering. Because if, if ever, like my rule also is like, I love uh, Johnny Guitar Watson. Mm -hmm. He's like the most uh, talented musician Texas has ever produced. Besides being a great guitar player and he taught Edda James how to sing, he's a phenomenal piano player. This guy just has everything. But then I did research, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do uh, Johnny Guitar Watson. I did research, and there's a big 7,000 word article by R.J. Smith, who wrote the James uh, Brown bio. And it's really good. And it's like, he, he's already taken. I can't do, I can't do Johnny Guitar Watson. Now somebody's already done something probably better than I would do. I gotta go find something that nobody's done. Something that nobody's done. So that's kind of what I've done. And in doing so, I put together a book of all these people that, uh, that nobody's really written about. I mean, people sometimes think I'm a, I'm a great researcher. I'm not, it's just nobody else tried. Nobody well, looked into Arizona drains. Nobody looked into Washington Phillips. I was the first one. And to this point of like hitting them where they ain't or this idea of the traces vanishing behind you, I think some of the value of some of this research too, especially when we're looking at East Austin blues and jazz is that Austin music kind of has this set narrative that a lot of people pick it up in like 1965 with the white youth counterculture. Mm -hmm. But this is, has always been a musical city. There have always been musicians here, like any city, especially like any Southern city, like any Texas city. So how do you think that narrative starts to change or get richer once we bring some of these East Austin blues and jazz figures in this East Austin story to the center of our attention? Well, East Austin's definitely been neglected. Uh, it was it might as well have been a, a wall instead of a freeway that separated East Austin and West Austin. Right. They had their own rules. <clears throat> you know, if, as long as you didn't uh, mess with uh, with the West Austin type people, you could do whatever you wanted in East Austin. That's how it was, you know. And so they had a real uh, Wild West kind of attitude. The clubs are crazy. There's wild stuff going on, and the cops didn't care as long as you didn't mess with white people. You know, it's kind of like or if you didn't murder somebody. But you can do after hours, you can do gambling in the back, all that stuff, it was wide open. But it's taken a long time for, since there was nobody really around to document it back then, uh, a lot of it's just gone. You know, sometimes you hope that you'll find more information. But like with Alvin Patterson, and I was telling this to Karan the other day, is that he was in a group called the Rhythm, Rhythm Kings. It's a black group from East Austin that played the Jade Room, they were in the same circuit as the 13 floor elevators. And they sometimes played the same bills. And nobody really knows about this group. It was, it was him and his brother. And I had looked, I, I didn't ask Alvin about it because I didn't really know that they was very prominent, but you can't find any information about the Rhythm, the rhythm Kings. It's just, I've tried, it's not out there, you know? So hopefully I'll get lucky somewhere. But I think a lot of times, uh, a lot of times people throw, when someone dies, they throw away everything. That drives me crazy. I, I must speak very, very frankly. I think it's the opportunity to do so. <laughs> um, I, I think it's part and parcel with a lot of the, quite frankly, a lot of the anti-Black sentiment that has kind of been this kind of low level in the Austin area. I mean, that's just the fact of the matter. You're, you're going to document and you're going to hold on to things that you care about. Right. And they have routinely, like people, the, the city, I would say, um, at least in part, and a lot of the, the cultural leaders 
um, have not done their due diligence and frankly their job in maintaining the history in the same way that, you know, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan's history is maintained to yeah. every extent possible. There's a big statue of him downtown, okay? He is not the best musician that's ever been here, yet there is a statue of him downtown. So, I mean, that, that, that you know, it's, it's not a minor thing. And I think I don't, I want to impress the point that that is not a minor thing. You hold on to the things that you care about. And if you don't have people, it's like this kind of a thing of, you know, Capone talks about a, a thing of right-handed power, right-handed strength, right-handed things. And so you're going to the, the strength is going to be maintaining strength. <laughs> so if you're going to talk about whiteness as a centering mechanism. A lot of things are just going to be sloughed off to the side. I mean, it's just, that's the, what it is. It's something I'm writing about, writing about right now um, in terms of the city building of Austin and so on and so forth. But I don't want to get too far into the weeds into that. But that's an important part. The, the culture and the policy are together. This and that is not, those are not two separate things. They're not me. They're, they're together. They're always together. So yeah. it, the, the fact that there is not a statue for, say, somebody like Kenny Dorham, um, who's had classic records, or, I mean, it doesn't even have to be Kenny Dorham. It can be Alvin Patterson. It could be B.L. Joyce. It could be, you know, I wrote about James Polk, who was, you know, uh, an instrumental figure. Um, so there's a lot of, of that. So, and then the, the way that, you know, gentrification works and just the, the throwing away of, of things, very casual throwing away of things, yeah. systematic throwing away of things. Yeah, let's um, talk about maybe geography a little bit because I think right. that, um, that shows some of this. We think about blues histories, you mentioning Stevie Ray Vaughan. When we talk about Austin blues history is a lot of those standard older narratives will have like Antone's front and center. Right. Um, but there is this long and this deep history in these neighborhoods of East Austin. Um, and we have the Victory Grill in some ways as a, a, a relic of a much larger like nightlife district of clubs that should be legendary and in that Mount Rushmore of Austin venues. But we keep losing. And one of the things in both of your work that I've always appreciated, you know, as a researcher, as an Austin historian, as just an Austinite. Um, is when you have physical addresses, like you're like, you're naming the space, you're locating the space. And then oftentimes, if you look up those spaces now, like there's nothing left, right? Like you're saying throwing away, like throwing away is throwing away pieces of paper and artifacts, but throwing away is also like the actual physical structure of these neighborhoods. Yeah. And especially because of gentrification, you don't have, you know, the movement, the physical movement of people's means that you don't have the memory in the neighborhoods, the people who would say like, oh, that was where this happened, right? Um, so can we talk a little bit about some of these spaces, the kind of the musical geography of East Austin that both of you, you know, have kind of restored, again, by naming some of these addresses and these places. I'm gonna to see to Michael on this. He knows a great deal. <laughs> I know well, I about the Victory Grill, but other places, Mike is on top of it. Well, before that, let me first say something about Steve Ray Vaughan though. He was totally ignored in Austin until he became famous nationally. Totally ignored. The same thing would happen with Black Pumas. If Black Pumas were not nationally recognized, nobody would care about him. So it's not this. It's not that he was white. And plus, the way he died in a helicopter crash at, his, at the peak of his popularity has a lot to do with the, with the statue too. But anyway, uh, and I I love Stevie Ray Vaughan. I think he's a great great. I do character. too. I do. I love him. Now, don't get me wrong. Yeah. I love Stevie Ray Vaughan. I know, but I. But, but go ahead, continue. But they, they have a, they have a, uh, they started doing like a walk of fame around the Palmer. I, I think Kenny Dorham is recognized in that. And, and some of the other people like Robert Shaw from East Austin, Martin Banks. I don't know if Martin Banks, I don't know if you came across him much at all, Karan. He was a trumpet player at the uh, Apollo House Band. I just missed him. Um, I wanted to do a story that I missed him. It was unfortunate. Yeah, his father was Buford Banks, was in the uh, band with, uh, B.L. Joyce. But I think one of the, I always put addresses in my articles if I know them. Like if I do something on Levada Durst, 
I'll put 1514 Hewlett Avenue. Because what I do a lot of times is I like to visit the places where the people live. Even if a lot of times they're torn down, it's a parking lot or whatever. I like to just go there anyway. I like to, it's kind of like when an actor gets a role and he'll go and, and meet the family. He'll talk to friends. What was his favorite restaurant? What did he order? Doing all this stuff. This stuff is, the script's already written. This is not going to be in the script, but they want to be, they want to feel like the person's part of them. And I think that that's, when I did a story on Israel Fontaine, who was a trumpet player, his, his grandfather was Jacob Fontaine, who started the, the Golden Dollar. Uh, and he talked about playing with Louis Armstrong at a place called the Cotton Club in, in Austin. Like Austin had a cotton club. And so I go right to the Austin History Center, which is a really great uh, research place. Is the when you, when you look up, I can't remember what they're called, the Cross Streets. So you can you can look up Cotton Club and it'll tell you the address it was at. And then you go there and it's it's not, it's not there anymore. There's no Cotton Club, but just to know that that's where Louis Armstrong played in the 30s in Austin and some of the other people. I don't know. I just I I think it helps. I think it helps get you in the spirit of of writing about it. And also other people can check it out. People can drive over and like Levator Durst, his house is where Don Roby sa uh, signed the uh, Bells of Joy, you know, the, the most popular gospel group of the 50s or 1951. Is the house behind, so he had a business at what's now the Salty Sow in Manor, right? No, that's Robert Shaw. Shaw. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, Robert Shaw, that, he, that's where Shaw's uh, grocery store was. Okay. But I did, you know, I'm, I moved to East Austin in, in 2003 for the expre express purpose of just finding out everything I could about, you know, uh, East Austin history, you know? And I'd, I'd lived there for like three years and, and then I moved on to somewhere else. I moved on to Smithville and I started writing. I met uh, Hannibal Lacumbe my first day I'm in town. And he tells me that there used to be a place in town where it was a, it was a nightclub where T-Bone Walker played and all the greats. And then right next to it was a, was a baseball, a backstop and, uh, Sonny Harper was the guy who owned the West End, uh, West End Club. He was a Negro League baseball pitcher for the Kansas City Monarchs. And they would host, uh, Satchel Paige came and pitched against the Smithville baseball team. And this is my first time in, in Smithville. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I wish that place was still here. And I'm driving around one day and there it is. There's an old club, turquoise colored club and a backstop next to it. It was there the whole time. And, and I'll tell you the reason I, I mentioned uh, people throwing away Sonny Harper lived to be 91 and he died about a year after I moved or a year before I moved to Smithville. And I called up his son and go, I'm really interested in doing something on your father. You know, does he have any papers? He goes, Oh, we threw everything away. He had a whole garage through, we threw, threw it all away. And I think this is, <clears throat> I think that, I think that white people are more nostalgic about their past because they had better pasts. You know, it's like black people, they don't like blues because blues reminds them of hard times. White people like blues more than black people do now, even though it was created by black people. And I think it's like that a lot of times with, with history. You know, this it's, it's, I just, and a lot, it, a lot of times it's not the fault of anybody. Like my thing is I go to a small town. I'd like to go to small towns and go to the library <clears throat> in small towns and they'll have all this history of the town. And there won't be, there won't be anything about black people, nothing. Even though black people are like 50% of the population, the library has got nothing on it. And it's really frustrating. There's well, a lot of this is about institutions, histories, rather than like how I think individual people think about histories, right? It's like whose yeah. histories get saved by institutions too. Like you're saying with the library, absolutely. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's starting, it's starting to be, they're starting to be better now about seeking out black history, but it's only recent. Very uh, recent, very recent. You know, I went for like Kenny Dorham. Like I went to the history center for Kenny Dorham. Yeah. And I don't want to say... I love the History Center. It's great. But I mean, for somebody so significant, <laughs> they had such so little for yeah. someone so significant. And I, I found that very interesting. So, you know, I, I guess it could be, it, he could be the, 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 you know, that he moved away. He went to New York. Yeah. You know, it could be that end of it too. Um, but plenty of people have gone, you know, so it's, it's kind of weird. Maybe it's the time period too. And he went away in, in, you know, he went off into the military, you know, the 20s, 30s. 
You know, yeah. he went to New York, he landed in New York, he didn't land here. You know, so it may be that part of it too. I have to be fair in that regard too, just location and time period and the fact that people, you know, you don't know that a guy is going to be a big star from Texas and then yeah. you need to record everything. So you don't know that either. Yeah. Um, but I'll take some, some other, let's take another subject that's not even a musical person. I, I was talking with Michael about um, just a quick example on a Night Train Lane. Night Train Lane is from here. He played football here. He moved here and died here. Yeah. You go, but if you, you go to, a, to anywhere, any sort of historical place, there is, he's in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. <laughs> There's next to nothing on him. He's first you know, Demita Joe, people like Demita Joe that I, that I, you know, I, I was trying to, you know, I've, I'm kind of in process of still kind of figuring out how to write about that um, because there are some family members here that it's, it's, I was going to say, I'm not going to name names, but it's kind of difficult to get certain things that I'm, I'm trying to get. Um, but there's not a lot of information on people. Everybody that I try to get a hold of, there's not like a lot of information. It is not, from the family necessarily it's just you know you i research other people and it's just like a loads of it they talk about it like so much of it and it's just like you know but a lot of black and i don't want to say it as specifically the black musicians i think it's again i think it's just a lot of black culture just has not been maintained i don't say i don't want to say just me again the two things are separate it's it's together what you want to choose to document, you'll document a good bit of it. You'll hold on to that history. Yeah. Um, I think it's really, to me, for me, it's very simple. It's, it's a lot of gray and a lot of, you know, nuances to it. But you're going to hold on to what you want to hold on to. Well, and yeah. I've been surprised by, you know, Hollywood Henderson, too, is another one. Um, right. uh, and then, like, Jackie Robinson has Houston, you know, Sam Houston College Connections and... Yeah, uh, you have to look to find those things when these are giants of their fields. Uh, and that relates to Kenny Dorham and Teddy Wilson as well. And I think some of you who research jazz, so Dave Oliphant's a good um, reference point for a lot of this. Yeah, you know, He talks about like Texas isn't really associated with jazz because so many of these jazz artists are pushed out of the state in order to find the success um, yeah. with Houston, a partial exception, but, but yeah. These big Austin figures. Yeah, he was a, uh, you know, I, I went and talked to Dave. Um, he was, in a, you know, he's as a resource at, about jazz history. It's he's he kind of has a certain uh, he follows a certain kind of a orthodoxy in terms of uh, what he qualifies is is like it's kind of like um, maybe something in the line similar of maybe Wynton Marsalis where they have these. It's a, it's a very specific orthodoxy of what they consider jazz and then what they consider good jazz. So <laughs> what, they, what they hold on to. And I think Dave and Wynton Marsalis are very similar in that regard. Um, I tried to talk to uh, Mr. Marsalis as well. And he was just, you know, he was, uh, you know, so Kenny was somebody for him, but it wasn't something that he, he was, eh. Yeah, Ol Oliphant yeah. was more into the, uh, the guys that went to Kansas City. You know, Buster Douglas, uh, yep. Hot, Lips, Hot Lips Page, that sort of thing. Or the ones that went to L.A., like uh, uh, Illinois Jaquette and, and his brother, Russell Jaquette. But he had he didn't really have anything about in his book about King Curtis, which <clears throat> I know King Curtis is not really jazz, but uh, he's, he's an important. He's an, one of the most important Texas musicians ever. And the, and the whole thing he got with tenor, but there's certain people that just will not include him in in uh, the list of great horn players because he was real successful and real commercial. Right, and I think this is to the Karan's point about like the the real jazz and real jazz history. So that okay. may be where, yeah, you know, someone like James Polk uh, too, who like these lines between jazz and blues and rhythm and blues aren't, they don't fit what the historical narrative always wants them. Like people are trying to force them into a category Right. James Polk is a master musician sort of across those lines, I would say. He's, he's an interesting figure in that, 
you know, he he is somewhat obviously, you know, he's, you know, at Texas or he was at Texas State and you know, he he was a, a teacher and he's he still sounds when I talked to him, the two times I talked to him before my piece, he definitely sounded like an educator. He spoke to me like an educator. He was teaching me the entire time. I'll say it like that. Yeah. Um but you know, I, I think the thing with with Polk is I could I could see that there are a lot of I I want to I don't want to say unresolved. I mean, there were I want to say it was unresolved, but I think he wished even as well as it went. I think there are certain little things that ended up being short circuited in some one way or another. That ended up pushing him to L.A. That he I think he wished kind of kind of would have popped off for him. I guess in a way that's the that's what I I took out of it a little bit. Even though he was wildly successful as. Uh, uh, Ray Charles is a musical director. So I would say that, you know, whatever the plan B, C, D was, if that was it, that's spectacular. Um, <laughs> well, Ray, Char Ray Charles always got his bands from Texas. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah, I mean, he got good. And the story that, that he tells, he told me about becoming his band director is hilarious. Like he, you know, I, I tell it in, in the, the story, but he's like, yeah, he calls me, and all of a sudden, I'm up in Pennsylvania, and all of a sudden, I'm in the band. And just like that. It was just, you know, everything just happened in the, in the work, and all of a sudden, he was there, and he was his guy. And he had to show and prove immediately, like, right there from day, minute one. Show me something. What you got? Okay, well, we're good. Okay, you, you showed me in the, in the pressure of, the, of this particular moment. I'm, I'm, you're my guy. That's, that's a lot of pressure. I mean, it's Ray, Char Ray Charles is Ray Charles, you know, especially in that time. My favorite career is I, I, I did a lot on Gil Askey. I interviewed Gil Askey mm -hmm. when he was 85. And uh, it, Diana Ross was one of the first acts to play ACL, uh, the, the hall, not the, not the festival. Um, and so I want to do a story. Uh, I want to interview him, but focus a lot on Diana Ross. He was their band leader for 20 years and also led tours with the Four Tops and everything. And I met with him at, at Denny's and for two hours, he did not talk about anything past the age of 19. It was all he, and he kept saying, people need to know this stuff. People need to know this stuff. He talked about BL Joyce. He talked about the streets, Hackberry. He would, he would have his hand on the desk and he, he, he was going through his mind, what street followed what street. And he went through all that. And it really, he really was stressing to me that don't, don't write up if you can write about me you don't go right to diana ross you go right to uh the yellow jackets band you know let's tell the story right and i was a little bit frustrated uh because you know I, of course i want to talk about the jackson five and his his role and get them discovered and stuff like that and he uh-uh and he he went through all those things and I, I was really interested in in what he said and then but i didn't feel like i had a good story and then he called me at my house at night and said Oh wait, hold on. And said, oh, I, I think uh, I, I think I, I didn't tell you enough about it. You, you were asking some other questions, and then he got into the showbiz stuff. But I think I think when I walked away satisfied with what he was telling about East Austin, I think that showed him that you know maybe I can trust this guy to to do a real story. But he did not want the glam. He wanted everybody to know about all the uh, the past and that sort of thing. Well, I and, think that speaks to I think that speaks to what. Um, what we're kind of talking about here and that I think at his age, he realized that if, because what had already happened had not been cataloged, right. had not been documented, I need to do that now. So he felt a personal responsibility to do it. That's what it sounds like to me. Oh, like that's, that's I exactly have a responsibility to, sit, to tell this man that's going to write all these things. I need to tell him now because I, nobody, nobody else has done it. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what he was doing. He was schooling me. You know, here, sit down. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you about stuff you don't know about. That's what it was all about. And I, I love that. You know, uh, but he he just has the most amazing career, I think. Just you know, moving to Australia and and uh, being a big. He's a huge figure. Before he died, he's a huge figure in Australia. And this guy from East Austin, that he left Austin at age 17 and came back once a year for. 60 years. Every year he'd come back one time and he said, you know, Austin, Austin never left him. So 
Uh, and then there's people like Teddy Wilson who moved away when he was six and that was it. And, you know, people claim Teddy Wilson as being an awesome musician, but I think you have to be, you have to at least start your career in Austin, you know? Yeah, I mean, and that's a way of like Austin and Texas music history is you will try to sometimes stretch claims on who counts, but you know. Um, Especially Austin, Austin, Austin wants to claim everybody. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, in the the ASCII piece, that was one where you had an address, an address that I was really interested in because I think you said that his stepfather was on Hamilton, maybe, and that sometimes, oh yeah, he his would uh, stay in that house. And so that's, I think that's also Mr. Overton Street. So like putting the math together, like Richard Overton would have yeah. lived, been a neighbor in some ways of. And he uh, tells us, he told me that story about the Supremes having uh, chitlins there. And they were saying how good it was. He could. He didn't want to tell them what they were. They were eating hog guts, but uh, and that, and Luther si Luther Simon, the guy who lived on Hamilton, who was married to uh, Gilbert Askey's mother, was there with him. He's eighty five years old, and he says, "He's my father." I go, "How can an eighty five year old guy have a father with him?" But Luther Simon was the one. It was a. He was a uh, vice principal at the school in uh, Gary, Indiana, where the Jackson Five went to school. And Gil was already in, at Motown and he called him up and said, you gotta come down and see these guys. They really caused a lot of noise and that, that got it started, but he was a very, he was a pretty humble guy, you know? And, and you know, he also worked with, really close with Curtis Mayfield and he wrote hits for Linda Clifford. The guy had a phenomenal career. But like I said, he just wanted to talk about East Austin. Uh, I mean, and I, I appreciate that. I think what we're driving towards is that, you know, people, um, focus on these histories because they've been undertold and they haven't been preserved and they haven't been valued. And I think that's, you know, kind of what we're trying to maybe turn a corner with here. And, you know, with each of you amplifying these chapters of Austin's music history and some of your writing and research, um, what kind of hopes do you have for uh, what the impact of that might be or how that might resonate in the Austin of here and now and the next chapters of either contemporary music scene or the way that we think of this music history? Do you think that there's something there? Well, I think someone like Adrian Casada has got a really good sense of history. And he's, he's really the leader right now. It's, it's weird, I was just thinking about this the other day that of the, probably the five or six acts for the biggest draw in Austin, four of them are African-American, which has never happened before, you know? And it's like Black Pumas, Ruthie Foster, Jackie Vinson, uh, Gary Clark Jr., you know? And maybe there's something happening with that. Maybe that's that's something that Austin has never really had much of a, a black history uh, scene, black music scene, I mean. That's, that's no, amplified that's by the industry in that way. No, and I think that's something that might be happening. It just takes, like I said, it just takes one person, like with B.L. Joyce, it takes one person. Maybe it's Adrian Casado. He's, he's got all these great projects. He had the project of the, uh, the you know, Grupo Fantasma, what he did with them. That was a great movement too. I mean, I think the thing that about Austin, people were on, on Facebook were saying, what's the Austin sound, you know? Is there an Austin sound? There's not an Austin sound, but the thing about Austin is that I think that the voice, vocals are usually the least important thing in Austin music. It's all about music, music, uh, musicality, songwriting. Like they had, uh, when MTV came to town, they did that cutting edge show with all Austin bands. And we're there in person, we're all going crazy. This is great, this is gonna be so great for Austin. Then the TV show came on and you go like, none of these people can sing. You know, there, nobody can sell, you can't sell records if you can't sing. Like Alejandro Escobedo, I love him, but he's never gonna be a star, a big star. He didn't have the voice. And it was like that, that was, to me is like the Austin theme is that it's other things besides the voice. But now with Eric Burton, then you got, a, you, know, you got the voice. Jackie Benson, you got the voice. Ruthie Foster, what a voice, you know? And I think that might be the thing where, that turns the corner because I don't think there's ever been a hip hop act from Austin to break out nationally. No, and not yet. It seems like there's somebody there, you know, they, there's a few people that I really enjoy, but yeah, it's, it's true. It's just, we haven't had a, a breakout. There's a, a, a significant scene here, but yeah. there are a lot of talented guys, but it's, it's, a, it's a specific thing. Austin is a very interesting, place to kind of be from and to kind of throw yourself into like you know the hip-hop industry is such that you know it's obviously very Los Angeles New York centric 
Yeah. So you, there's a few outfits that are like, but they're from like really gritty places. Like, you know, you have the, 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 the Griselda group of, of rappers that are from Buffalo, but they're from the inner city of Buffalo, New York. So that's, wow. I've been to Buffalo, New York. That's <laughs> a tough place to be from. Like, and so I think that's where, where you know, Austin is kind of like, you know, it's not, it's not tough. Right. Now, there are tough neighborhoods and there's tough people, but they, we don't have this sort of national thing of, of Austin being a tough place because it's the tech place. It's not, so, you know, you know, so that, that's kind of put to the back burner. A lot of the hip hop stuff nationally too is uh, based around producers. Like right. Atlanta had all those producers. I don't know if there's any real big hip hop producers in Austin or any studios. Not so far, not so far, not so far. There's some talented ones again, there's talented guys here, but we haven't had one that's kind of propelled the, the scene forward and into yeah. the national spotlight yet. I'm not a, I don't know much about hip hop, but in, in my book, I did have a chapter on the DOC. DOC it, is a DOC is, I would say. He was, he's, a, he's the first, uh, he's the first Texas uh, rapper to make it. I, I don't yeah. want to get into the weeds here. Houston and I can talk about. very, I can talk about the DOC and I can talk about Scarface and all these people. I could talk hours <laughs> about these things. Maybe yeah. that's our uh, a second episode. Yeah, this, yeah, we'll have to talk about <laughs> it. In terms of uh, you know these stories, I think now is a moment where we can both reflect back on the significance of this history, and it does resonate with the moment that we're living in. You know, the way that people like Jackie Vinson, I, I think, has very um, you know has used her platform well in this past year uh, to force some of these conversations, and I think that if we you know keep talking through them and connect them back to the rootedness of this community. Um, like you were saying, Karan, it's not, this music and cultural history isn't separate from the institutional and city history. Like there's, it, it's of a single piece. And I, I think it's important to have these kind of conversations and to use what institutions and platforms we have to advance them. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm just worried that there's not gonna be any clubs left when this uh, pandemic is over. You know, yes. That's, that's, that's the house of cards that Austin's built on is the clubs. Right. You know, without the clubs, you don't have South by Southwest. And, you know, a lot, I, I love South by Southwest. We're going to be two years without it. And it's going to change the town a lot. Yeah. Uh, because we don't have that, that infuse of money. And, but, you know, if there's musicians and uh, they love to play, they love to make music, they'll, they'll always have that. I just worry about the uh, feasibility of it. Yeah, uh, there is a lot of fear and anxiety around what comes next in this scene. And the hopeful path that I see out of it is that we can kind of reboot uh, like our identity and how we think of this as a music city. Um, some of the artists we've been talking about, I think, help us do that a little bit. Um, and again, maybe some of this, the hip hop and the music scene is a conversation for another day. But I, I did, I wanted to thank y'all for uh, joining us for this particular conversation for Boston blues and jazz history um, rooted in the important work that y'all have been doing over these past couple of years. And um, as we sort of close out, I just wanted to uh, offer you, if, if we have people tuning in to listen to this who are interested in finding you and your work, where are some of the places they might do that? Well, I have a, I have a website, michaelcorcoran.net. <clears throat> I put a lot of stuff up there. I'm not, I'm, Nobody's really beaten the door down for me to write for them. So I put everything on the website and let it go at that. And, uh, and I write for Texas Highways a lot. That's my main place that pays me. It's a good platform. Yeah. It is. It is. Um, I still, you know, I'm writing stories. I'm still, I'm, I'm on the hook for, for, a, for a couple for the Austin Chronicle. So um, yeah, so for the Chronicle, uh, it's Austin, uh, the, the music, the Texas music is a, that's a fun outlet um i like they just let me do what i do so i turn it in and it gets printed so I'm, I'm for the most part so i'm, I'm happy uh, so stay tuned i have a couple things coming all right well thanks so much gentlemen uh, thanks for having me and, and karan good seeing you karan absolutely yeah thank you all right man <laughs>